Hi everyone, this is Dr. Nowley. In this second uh, series of videos about the kinetic molecular theory, I want to discuss some of the concepts that we will develop as a result of applying the kinetic molecular theory to gases. And there are certain terms you want to be familiar with in this particular segment, and these terms are listed here on the title of this topic, which is root mean square velocity, or sometimes shortened as RMS velocity. Uh, average kinetic energy or total kinetic energy as well as Mac Maxwell distribution and we'll go through each of these um, concepts throughout the series of videos in this segment. So the first thing to remind you of is just the postulates of the kinetic molecular theory. Um, remember there's five different things that were listed and if you remember that the idea of the kinetic molecular theory is basically to uh, assume that gas molecules are, rel uh, are, are very small, relatively small, and the distance between them are really large, so uh, the volumes of these gas molecules can be considered to be nothing or negligible. Uh, we also consider that there is no intermolecular interactions between the gas molecules, so they're kind of like independent particles that are moving past one another. Now when they hit each other, they have a collision, but that's not an interaction. That's not an attraction or repulsion. They just happen to hit one another. Uh, two things don't have to be repelled or attracted by each other to hit one another. So, um, so that's a kind of a, a, a separate concept, but there's no intermolecular interactions between these particles uh, on their own. And we also say that the average kinetic energy of the molecules of, of a gas depends on its temperature, and I hope in the previous video when I walk, walk you through these uh, simulation to show you what happens when temperatures change, you can clearly see that something's happening to the molecules when temperatures decrease or increase. Okay, And if you don't remember, then you go back and look at those videos again. Uh, but you want to take notes and what, what you, know, you actually observe there, because that's going to be important when we're discussing the next several concepts. Okay, so again, this simulation, we're going to uh, use them a couple of times again in this series of videos. So if you uh, didn't watch the previous video, you should, so that you understand what the simulation is all about. And a lot of, uh, for most of you, I think this is something that you can easily actually run on your own computer, provided that you have Java, or if you're at the school computer, you can also use it. So. Um, you know, I would encourage you to do that to kind of play a little bit with the with the different variables, pressure, volume, number of moles, and temperature, and see what happens to the simulation. Okay. Now, the first uh, part of this, uh, the first video here, really, I just want to spend some time developing these a uh, couple of these equations that are important in understanding the molecular behavior of gases. And the two equations are the equations for velocity and the equation for kinetic energy. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is kind of walk you through a little bit of a derivation uh, of the ideal gas law from the model of the gas particles that are proposed by the KMT, by the kinetic molecular theory. Okay, in other words, this idea that the gases are randomly moving particles, they don't interact with each other, and the distances between them are large relative to the sizes of the particles. Okay. Um, now, I, I put this in huge red letters here, that you're not required to derive the ideal gas law from the KMT, okay? So that's not my intention here, uh, because in order to do this, actually, you're going to need to know a little bit of physics um, and well enough to actually do and understand the derivation. So you're not required to do that in this class. But what I want you to sh uh, kind of have an appreciation for is really more the fact that the ideal gas law is based on experiment. We, we had all these experimental laws, uh, Boyle's law and, and all the other ones, and we combined them together into something called the ideal gas law. And we now have a theoretical model for gases called the kinetic molecular theory. If the theory is correct, there should be a way to take uh, the simple uh, assumptions that are uh, given in the kinetic molecular theory and use some of these uh, basic ideas in physics to derive the ideal gas law from the kinetic molecular theory. So that's what we'll do in this slide here and I'll walk you through each of the steps. Uh, 
again, if you don't understand it, don't worry too much about it because at the end we'll have two equations that I will emphasize to you that you have to know. Uh, if you don't know how it's derived, then you just memorize those two equations. But the idea here is we're going to start with uh, basically a box filled uh, uh, with these gas particles. They're all moving around randomly. The box is going to have a certain surface area that's going to be labeled A here. And then uh, it also, the uh, particles all have uh, the same velocity. The velocity is given the symbol uh, U in this case. Okay, so just make sure that's a little bit different. Usually velocity has the symbol V. But because we also call volume, we also give volume the symbol V, we want to use the letter U in this case as the uh, average molecular speed. That's the symbol for it. Um, we have N number of molecules. Um, this is really Na, Avogadro's number of molecules, so in one mole of gas. Um, and then each particle has a mass uh, given by the symbol M. The box uh, has a length of L. Um, and then we have random motion uh, in the particles, so approximately uh, the way we think about the, the velocity is that velocity, you know, velo velocity is, is, a, is a, what we call a vector quantity in physics, so it's composed of the velocity of the particles that are broken down in the three dimensions, x, y, and z. We're going to do this derivation in just one of the dimensions first, just to simplify the derivation, and then at the end we're going to uh, express the express the velocity in terms of the velocity in the three dimension. Okay. Okay. So we're going to start here with our uh, brief derivation of the ideal gas law. And what we have is we're going to just start with description of pressure. So remember that pressure is equal to F over A force per unit area. And if you've taken physics, you know that force is also expressed as mass times acceleration. Uh, over uh, area in this case, which is a surface area. This comes from Newton's second law. And then uh, acceleration, it's basically the change of velocity as a function of time. So this is m times uh, this quantity here is a little hard maybe for you to see, but it's delta u over delta t, which is just the change of velocity. Remember, we label the velocity as u per as a function of time. So how the velocity changes as a function of time. Now, uh, remember, we assume that these particles have elastic collisions. What elastic collisions mean is that the uh, collision, the momentum of the collision before and after is the same. Momentum is m times velocity. So if it's the same, but in the opposite direction, uh, then what's going to happen is the following. So if you say delta u, which is the change in velocity, is final velocity minus initial velocity. The final velocity, if the initial velocity has a value, uh, if the final velocity has a value u, the initial velo velocity is the same number, but it's in the opposite direction, so you can think of it as negative u. So then the whole thing just goes to become 2u in its value, and that's what's written on this line. Okay, So this is the important part because we want to go put that back in the delta u expression at some point. And then we also want to figure out what this delta t expression is. So delta t is really so delta t is really a measure of um, the amount of time it takes for a collision to happen on the same surface uh, with this particle. Okay, so in other words, if this is the surface here, then the question is, there's a collision here, and how long will it take for the particle to hit that spot again? Uh, that's delta t. So if you think about it, if the, del the, the, si the particle has a length l, which is what we assumed before, right? In order for it to get back again, it has to basically travel that whole distance and come back here um, to hit that sp uh, spot again. And that's, that distance is 2l, right? Because you go that one, you know, you go one back that distance is L and then back here again it's 2L so then you have 2L the distance that has to be traveled is 2L and remember that distance and velocity and time is related so distance is equal to velocity times time right so in this case the velocity is U the time is delta T so then distance which is 2L is equal to U times delta T and so we can express delta T as just 2L over U 
So now we also have delta t, which can go to the num uh, denominator portion of this expression. Okay, so we go back then to the force expression. So remember, force is equal to m times delta u over delta t. So now, force is m times delta u over delta t. m times delta u is just 2u from this second line here. Uh, and then delta t is equal to 2l over u, which I put in right here at the bottom. And so if you uh, factor out the u, you know, get the u's together, what you get in the end is that the 2's cancel. What you get is mu squared over l is equal to the force. Uh, expression okay now remember that uh, pressure is force per unit area so then it'd be this expression divided by area mu squared over L divided by area okay which is which is this one right here and then but then the L just comes to the bottom right because that's the denominator denominator so then you have L times a length times area is of course just volume so then what you get is now mu squared over volume okay is equal to the pressure if we're just talking about one particle okay the mass of each particle times its velocity divided by the volume of the box if you have one mole of particle then instead of just mass of one particle you have to multiply that mass by Avogadro's number which is you know six times ten to the twenty third particles per mass you know per particle right so you have to multiply the mass by that to get you the mass of one mole of particle so that's what I did here is just pressure of one particle times n which just symbolizes Avogadro's number should be n uh, sub a there and so what you get in the end is this expression which is mu squared over v times the number of moles uh, n times Avogadro's number the n is just inserted here because uh, assuming that it's not one mole, then it will be whatever number of moles times the actual Avogadro's number, because then that will give you the total number of particles. Okay, if it's one mole, then you can cross that out. It is just times Na. Okay, all right. So after doing all of that work, what we get as the final expression is something that look like it looks like this: P PV. Okay, if we factor in the V to this side, is equal to n times m u squared u in this case is the velocity in the x direction so we denote it as u a sub x uh, squared times Avogadro's number this is for velocity in the x direction only remember what I said earlier velocity is really a vector and it has three components it's uh, composed of velocity in the x direction y direction and z direction and then you add them up together uh, do a vector calculation to get the uh, the size of the velocity overall and so with respect to the velocity in the uh, x direction the total velocity u is uh, one third of it is in the x direction okay so in other words this ux squared is equal to one third u squared u being the velocity in the three dimension okay so then we can write this same equation as PV equals N times, if you want to think about it, M times one third U squared times NA, but then I put the one third on this side uh, so that the equation looks more similar to each other. This is what we would have gotten if we take it uh, straight from the theory. Okay, we would get this equation. Now, of course, you remember the ideal gas equation has the following form PV equals NRT. And what I want to emphasize here is how similar these two equations look like. PV in both cases equals to N times a certain factor here. Okay, RT here and then these guys right here. And in the next video, we'll talk about what the meaning of that is. But you should, uh, one of the things you should be able to appreciate is that constant, that gas constant. What is it, what, what, what is that value telling us? What is it corresponding to molecular molecularly okay so we'll talk about that in the next video